Coming up on this week's show, a huge new Star Fox mod arrives. Sega's next mini console is coming to the UK. And we catch up with rare legends Kev Bayliss and Paul Makacek. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you every Friday with our friends at Bitmap Books. Now, something you should check out from them, an incredible read, The Games That Weren't. From the Atari 2600 to the PlayStation 4, this book tells the surprising untold stories of video games that entered production never to be heard of again. You can get that and the rest of their retro gaming books from bitmapbooks.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 341, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show. Just before the weekend, we squirt this little podcast out over the information superhighway. I haven't I heard that set. phrase for years, <laughs> the information superhighway. <laughs> Whilst you're surfing the web, you can download the Retro Hour podcast. <laughs> yeah, we don't offer it in real audio, unfortunately. Uh, could be an idea one day, though. But yeah, this is a show that every week brings you up to speed on what's been happening in the world of retro gaming and technology from over the last week. And of course, we bring you legends of the industry each week for an interview to hear their story. Now, today is a very special live panel that we recorded at Retro Messa in Norway. And uh, you might hear a bit of a Norwegian twang in our voices after spending uh, three days out there in Norway over the weekend. How incredible was this event? It was, uh, it was, it was unreal. It was my first kind of foreign event. So you guys have done a couple over the years. We've obviously, we've done lots of UK ones, but I've never done an abroad one. I just want to say the whole experience was absolutely amazing. And the guys at Retro Messa, I have never known anybody to be so organized and so attentive and just so welcoming to the whole situation and just made us feel so comfortable and then just for the whole show just to be amazing with all the amazing guests who were all so humbling and just so down to earth as well um and it was just absolutely amazing to hang out with the rare crew and just make friends with them all and meet john saint john as well which was Mm. just insane and just crazy stories about him and stuff and then the event itself was just absolutely fantastic and then of course meeting all the fans and we met some really 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 cool people there who were also patrons and stuff as well which was absolutely amazing and then of course hanging out with my best friends for the weekend um, was really fun as well yeah we don't usually have an excuse to hang out you see because we're like busy with work and stuff and it was great to go out uh we had a few delays at the airport which was a bit scary at first because we were like is this really gonna happen um, but it actually did, and it was an awesome weekend. And like Joe says, the love that we got from people out there was just insane. We had uh, people coming up, you know, patrons. Uh, it was just absolutely fantastic. And the talk as well that we're going to do today uh, was really interesting. So we previously talked to Paul Makacek about kind of Rare's history with the Game Boy, and we said we've got to follow this up with a second part where we go into stuff like Donkey Kong Land. And we thought why not get Kev Bayliss on as well? Because he's a fantastic guest. We've had him on this show before. A designer in Rare does really beautiful art, does a lot of the characters for like Donkey Kong Country. And um, this this part is really about the kind of history of going from Silicon Graphics all the way down to the Game Boy and getting the kind of pushing the Game Boy to its absolute limit. So it's a really interesting interview and it's great to have that kind of live vibe as well what what did you think of the event dan i'd say it's probably my favorite retro gaming event i've ever been to Mm. it was you know we obviously went to this event back in 2019 but like like you said joe you know the organization of it the the friendliness of people there i mean we landed at like half past 10 on friday night and there was actually a crew of norwegian podcasts who took us out for the night wasn't there it was um the guys from spell podcast Um, so I've got to give a shout to uh, AD and all the guys from there as well. And a group of others actually arranged a little welcome party. So we had a few drinks in a bar on Friday night. Um, and then on the Saturday, I mean, we actually had our own little table where you guys were selling some of your duplicate games and stuff. And, uh, you know, Hags Lab, who's one of our patrons, and uh, he's always on the patrons hangouts. He's actually made, we've mentioned this before, a searchable database of the retro hour that you can run on a Commodore 64 
and he actually printed out some um, floppy disk labels and gave us a physical version of it on five and a quarter inch floppy disk that I thought was incredible. That was insanely um, and cool, ter- wasn't it? Yeah, it was just, you know, the fact that people go and make the time and effort. I mean, we've got goodie bags, we've got Norwegian chocolate, crisp beer given to us as well by guys like, you know, Terrier, Xander, at Jesse, who's one of our friends as well, took us out, actually gives a bit of a tour of the area and took us out for dinner on Saturday night. And um, Frank, who we met there as well. Honestly, there's so many to talk, talk about, but it's, I think it's just blows my mind a little bit that obviously... We do the show each week here in the UK, but when you actually travel to another country and, you know, there are people that listen religiously every week, it still blows my mind <laughs> that, you know, we have fans in other countries around the world. Yeah, and I think I think it was a bit of an unknown as well because after COVID and stuff, um, yeah. you know, uh, they, they, they hadn't run an event, so they were really unsure about the numbers. And it was the busiest I'd ever seen it. You know, there were, there were thousands of people over the weekend and uh, it was great to be in a kind of lively busy show again and uh you know joe also joined us on both panels as well so it was that kind of experience oh, of doing I, uh both i panels. was the panel i was the panel king i did three panels <laughs> i did more than both of you and, <laughs> i was on everyone <laughs> and each one you know the rooms were packed to the back yeah. uh yeah to the rafters it was it was a, a very successful event i think yeah like you said joe had never done a panel live on stage with us before so we thought you know Initiation. It was a. Uh, I know. It's like, a... <laughs> it got me on all three of them. Chuck him like, in the deep right. end. <laughs> Chuck me in the deep end. Yeah. But no, it was it was really fun. Um, it was really cool to be up there, and you know, it it just bl- blows my mind that I've got photos now of me like sat on stage with like Kev Bayliss, Paul Makachek, David Doak, you know, sat there talking about the games that I grew not only grew up playing, but found out that you know a couple of years ago that these games were all developed in like the town I was from to now be sitting on the stage with them all asking them questions in front of hundreds of people is just like, it's just mind blowing. And just like I say, everybody was so humbling and, you know, it was just, it was really cool that they were all up for drinks and, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, had breakfast with them and stuff. It was amazing. Yeah, and that, like you mentioned then, I mean, you know, hundreds of people. Th- these panels that we did were standing room only, weren't they? There were mm-hmm. people like literally clambering to look around the edge of the door at the rare panels and stuff. So uh, if you couldn't make it along to Retro Mesa at the weekend, we are going to bring you uh, this panel that Ravi and Joe did on the Sunday with uh, Paul Makachek and Kev Bayliss from Rare. Some really interesting insights. And that will be on the show in around half an hour from now. Roll on next year. And we have got more events coming up, actually. If you want to see where we're going to be for the rest of 2022, uh, check the podcast show notes. We've put them all in there. Now, before we get into um, the stories that we're going to talk about this week, let's give a quick mention to uh, a bit of a sad story, actually, um, that we heard about this week, that a legend in the industry has passed away. And if you grew up reading magazines here in Britain, stuff like Crash and Zap, You'll be familiar with the artwork of the legendary Oliver Frey, who sadly passed away in the last week, didn't he? Uh, Yeah, and Oliver Frey had that um, kind of amazing cover art style that um, came from, you know, some of the earliest comics in Britain and stuff. Um, Like, well, there was a a recreation of Eagle Comics and uh, he'd done the the artwork from Dan Dare on that and then later went on to the uh, Spectrum games as well. Uh, he was on a lot of the front covers of um, Crash, which was a, a very famous one, uh, Zap 64 as well, uh, Amiga magazines. I remember seeing his art absolutely everywhere. And uh, it really, you know, when when you got these games and you had this kind of real feeling and excitement about it, you know, Oliver really helped create those uh, really exciting images. And um, it, it's very sad that he's passed away. You know, this is... Uh, news that's been all over the place i've seen lots of stuff um from him and you know um particularly for the spectrum users this is this is going to be a great loss yeah and i think um he was obviously such a big figure in the 80s british computer scene in particular uh and you know i've seen tributes from guys like you know jazz rignall who obviously you know worked with him at Crash and Zap back in the day too. And, you know, the thing is, back then, I mean, we, you know, Bob Wakelin from Ocean passed away a couple of years ago too, who was another, just an absolute icon for cover design on these games back in the day. And really, they were so important. I mean, you look at, there's actually a really amazing video that's been put together by Retro Crisis, showing the artwork of Oliver Frey from 
1948 to 2022. And he's done so much in the, the style of it. I mean, it's quite varied, actually. There's a lot of kind of fantasy stuff, but also some quite cartoony stuff as well. But you remember back then, I mean, the amount of games I would literally just buy based on the cover art and magazines as well. I mean, when you went into a shop and that was what drew you to the shelf. And often you get home, and you, you know, you look at the back of the box or something or boot it up on your Commodore 64 and it'd be a very basic looking game. <laughs> Nothing like the cover art, which made it look incredible. But really, we can't overstate the importance of covers in terms of getting people attracted to the games in the first place. Definitely. They were, they were a big source of excitement. And like Oliver kept going as well. He did some great stuff with uh, Retro Fusion Books later on as well, who um, mm. actually relaunched Crash. And, uh, you know, he's also selling canvases and artwork and stuff. So, you know, this is this is a big loss. And um, I think his, his work's going to be iconic for a long time. Yeah, so rest in peace, Oliver. And if you want to check out that video, I'll put that in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, this is quite cool. A massive mod of Star Fox allows new levels, new ships, weapons, and even multiplayer. How does this work then? So this comes from a modder called Kando Wantu. Um, and what he kind of started out to do was to mod Star Fox 2 and use a lot of the, you know, kind of like assets from that and the multiplayer from that to kind of create his own kind of version of Star Fox. Um, but I'm not too sure why, but essentially he actually kind of went back to the drawing board of Star Fox 1. And it kind of started out as a... A continuation of that game um and what he's what he's made is i've watched the video it's a two-hour video and it looks absolutely incredible but i don't want to say he's modernized it but you know like in star fox how you control star fox and then you've got the other the the, the rest of the crew you know um slippy and uh, falcon or, or the ai crew yeah kind of join you like yeah. they they now so the first thing you kind of notice is they now have like their ammo and their health like their shield and stuff like in the top left corner and you can like give them commands on what to do and it kind of reminds me of like star fox um star wars squadron and like rogue leader from like the n64 and gamecube and stuff so you can now kind of like control them a little bit but then there's also this multiplayer aspect that is added into the original game which i think is absolutely amazing and then also as well as the original map where you have the route to what planets you want to go to and what levels you can do he's kind of added his his own they call it a map but essentially a second campaign to the game where there's like 20 planets on there and you can plan your route and he's made all original levels using all the graphics and sprites and they just look amazing like levels of you like in gi- in ginormous like spacecrafts like in big spinning rooms and he's got this all running it's all it's all modded um and it does say you know it is using the roms so i imagine it's not running on the super nintendo i believe this is running on computer but it is Hack, hack you know the original game being hacked it's it's um, interesting was there a net play option for the original super nintendo because uh it does say that it's running through net play but it could do yeah five five players which is <laughs> yeah pretty intense so, you know so there is of uh, there is net play on the original super nintendo with the satellite uh is it called the satellite view in japan um but i don't oh, yeah. i don't think Star Fox had like an online like capability for playing and stuff i believe the the net play the satellite view was for downloading i could be wrong but i think it was for downloading games like different versions of zelda and stuff like that came out on it um so it it doesn't really explain how he's playing this online i'm going to go ahead and assume he's just doing it through the rom on his computer but like you say it's got that five player online and everybody's like controlling all the other you know like falcon and and Slippy, I forget the name of the, the rabbit's name. And it just looks like chaos. Like I was watching it and I was just like, <laughs> this looks amazing, but I'd be so lost. Like, which one am I like flying around shooting? Um, but it just looks so good. And the levels, like it it looks like a genuine Nintendo product. Like if you showed me this, Dan, or Ravi, and you just sent it over to me and didn't say it was a, like a mod and just said, oh, it's coming out on the Switch. It's just a, a new Star Fox game with the original retro graphics. I would just believe you. I'd just say, yeah, that looks amazing. Let me download I, I it and think play it. It's a very smart way that he's done it with using the AI original mm. ones and turning them into the other players because it yeah. means there's not a huge slowdown or lag. It's like that's kind of how the game was built. I can imagine if he was replicating, you know, the single player ship and doing that five times, that yeah. could probably cause an issue and a real slowdown. But um, yeah, th- this looks 
surprisingly smooth for, for yeah it, it is. there doesn't really seem to be much slowdown in there um well re- certain times when you get a lot on screen but i mean Star Fox did that anyway yeah, didn't it, they? It, yeah. It, even though that was a super fx game it always felt like it was really pushing the limits of the super nintendo oh yeah absolutely and and if i remember rightly it's quite it's actually quite an early game for the super nintendo or around the middle even with that fx chip and stuff um he did get three yeah. yeah he did get some help from some other modders um, who helped him to get it all running and stuff like that. So, you know, a big communi- community effort there. But yeah, if this came out as a full product, I would love it. But I love how, you know, it states at the end, like, you know, to play this, you need to download an official ROM. You need to be o- you need to own and pay for a ROM. Like, I-, I just love how they're trying to make sure Nintendo doesn't come after them. Yeah, it couldn't actually release a ROM as well. Otherwise, it'd be taken down probably the same day. Yeah, And it looks like they've added some new stuff in there. So they've got like new ships, new weapons. Mm. Uh, oh, yeah. There's a new fourth course as well, like endurance run code. Um, yeah, a god mode code as well, so you can you can do god mode if you if you're not very good at it. Um, I did uh, that. Yeah, and I can imagine this is just uh, great for fans who who really want to embrace that. But also, if you can get five of you and hook up, I, I can imagine there'll be some uh, mad playthroughs going going online, you know, uh, or on YouTube. That would be crazy, like five CRT set up with five setups to play it all just sat in a row, just having like a real big squad-based game on Star Fox. So this is called Star Fox Exploration. Um, and it looks like, yeah, there's a video available at the moment at 1 hour 25 if you want to um, see what it looks like so far. And apparently it's going to be available um, late October, apparently. He said um, initially it was meant to be out in August, but it's obviously quite a big job. Um, mm-hmm. so it's been pushed back to late October, but you can uh, check out the work in progress so far. I'll put that in our show notes and at the retrohour.com. Now it is the last weekend of the month coming up. You know what that means on Sunday night, boys. We're going to have our Patreon hangout. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Whoop, whoop, whoop. This is a bit of the uh, the month that we always look forward to when Sunday evenings we get as many of our patrons that want to join us together on Google Meets and we all just have a couple of hours of completely geeking out. Yeah, man, it's 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 so fun just to kind of get together with everybody. Like I use it as an excuse with my wife. Like she's like, oh, another Sunday night. And I'm like, yeah, but it's with the boys, with the boys. And I get my cider and, you know, I get my sweets as well. And, you know, I'll go up there and I usually spend a little bit of money. Because <laughs> everybody's going to say, and your bank card. Yeah, well. my bank card, because everybody's showing off all the stuff they've been buying. Um, it's just really awesome. That, you know, I, I just... It still blows my mind, kind of coming back to what I was saying about Retro Massa, that people support us like this and actually, you know, not only support the show and us, but come on and then talk to us about it and stuff as well. Um, I absolutely love it. It's so nice. Um, you know, we, we, we've seen a lot of people on the uh, patrons hang out and chat to them, but then being able to see them in person was a, a really nice connection. And we're also doing the Retro Hour after hours where we have been given a choice of games and uh, mm. these are games that have been picked by our patrons for us to play we're gonna have to go through them and uh give our little reviews on them and uh it should be really interesting there's some titles that i've never heard of that um i've got to check out uh for total different systems and joe is finally gonna play some dizzy i am gonna play some dizzy <laughs> i am actually going to boot it up as soon as we're finished recording this Um, and I'm going to crack on with it. And I've told my wife, like, I'm having, like, a whole day today of, like, kind of, like, admin in my office on my computer, and I've, I've, like, told her, like, if you come up and I'm, like, playing Amiga, like, I'm I'm actually working, like, I'm doing this little retro hour. Like, like, I'm not just sat, like, you know, playing games all day trying to hide from my wife and daughter. Just just there on Dizzy till, like, four in the morning. Yeah, I might end up, yeah, it might end up happening. (laughs) Well, this is a little um, kind of a challenge, I guess, we said to our patrons, you know, pick some games that you think we might not have played before, maybe something a bit out of our comfort zone or stuff that you've heard us talking about that we said we haven't played. So, or suggest one of your all-time favourite games and we'll give our reviews on it. And we've got like hundreds of them through Discord and patrons. So we're kind of working our way through those. We're going to pick three each, aren't we, for yeah. this weekend's After Hours podcast, which is an exclusive podcast that we do each month just for our gold member patrons or above. So if you want to get involved in that, and you actually unlock all the previous episodes, of which I think there are 26 episodes now. So if you join us on Patreon this weekend, you get access to all of those. And of course, you can join us for the Hangout this coming Sunday evening. And really the main reason that you're doing it, of course, is to make sure that we can just keep the lights on and keep this podcast coming out each and every Friday. And if you'd like to join our patrons community, all the details are at theretrohour.com. 
Now, we're going to be hearing this um, incredible panel, Paul Makachek and Kev Bayliss, live from Retro Mesa, the rare legends coming up on the show in the next few minutes. Before that, just a couple more stories to get through. Now, uh, Yours Revenge, what a game that was back in the day. And uh, it's nice to see it's getting a bit of a reboot. Yeah, this is this is really interesting to see. So, um, like you say, Yars Revenge is a, a classic for the twenty six hundred, and uh, it was created by Howard Scott Warshaw, who we've actually um, had on the podcast. And uh, very hard game as well. I tried it to play is that a not tough longer. game, definitely. And I don't know if you guys have heard of this recharged series. So this is a series of games that have kind of been reloaded or or recharged for the uh, future, and. Um, this version of uh, Yars Revenge is called Yars Recharged. And I tell you what, this this is going down really well with people. It seems to be a really interesting title. Um, it's It's got a very indie game feel, but they've they've not kind of just redone it in a HD, you know, remake. They've uh, quite changed the concepts, actually, and uh, turned it into an entire new game. And um, it does look really intense and fast, but it's got that old retro feel you know it feels like it's part of the yard series like uh you have to defeat these huge bosses in it and um you have to kind of time it correctly so that um you know you pick the time to actually attack the, sh- the boss you've got to break down barriers in there to get to them and uh you know it's it's got that shoot 'em up feel but also it's got abilities like um co-op play so uh the original didn't have co-op and and this one's got co-op so you can play along with a friend now uh i've seen a few people say that it's not got as much features as the other recharged games which had stuff like the uh, high scoreboard and stuff but i think it looks really good and uh it's coming out for all your systems but also it's of course coming out for the vcs dan so you may have something <laughs> to uh run on your atari vcs now well we talked about this before this is kind of atari reimagining a lot of its arcade classics. They've done a few already, haven't they? Centipede, yeah. Asteroids, Missile Command, Breakout as well. Uh, this one, though, it's actually quite an interesting choice to do Yars Revenge, because even though I think it's a fan favourite, it's maybe not quite as well known as stuff like Asteroids and Missile Command. Um, but I've got to say, I mean, looking at this, if you didn't tell me this was a reboot of Yars Revenge, I probably wouldn't link the games together. It does look quite different from the video yeah um, the, the original was very basic wasn't it so so yeah and you're right they did do a uh, like breakout as well which was another one and a uh, gravatar and uh, missile command and yeah obviously atari are releasing these on their rebooted console as well the the new atari vcs which obviously i mean i think it's a good choice for them to do that um the fact that they put them out of the systems as well means if you do want to play it you don't have to own one of them it's not like a you know a killer app for that console but um it is nice to see them giving some love to those classic franchises and bringing them back again interesting that they chose a howard scott warshaw game do you think they're going to do is a uh, his most famous game as a, a recharge? Or maybe E.T. Recharged. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Start a whole new crash. No, that didn't happen just because of that game, as we found out in the interview. But um, That would be cool, though, wouldn't it? Yeah. For them. Imagine if they made it really good. I reckon then, it would sell of... quite well. Like, I reckon yeah. people yeah. would actually love that as like a little silly thing. It'd be some nice redemption as well if you know there's a version of it that everyone loved that came out like 40 years after the original. Yeah, don't call it Recharge. Call it E.T. Redemption. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. Have that idea on us, Atari. So um, I'm liking the fact that they're kind of revisiting a lot of these classics as well. Yeah, and I'm, and, I'm uh, liking the price point as well. It's ten dollars, which yeah. uh, is just nice to pick up. You know, a, a short game and a kind of retro, futuristic inspired one uh, for ten dollars. I think that's pretty cool, guys. Yeah, so hopefully they'll keep bringing out these uh, reboots of classic games in this range. So if you want to check out that, the uh, reboot of Yars Revenge is called uh, Yars Recharged. I'll put a link to that in our show notes too. And I know you've been hyped about this, Joe, because we actually did a panel over the weekend in Norway where we kind of talked a bit about kind of our background in gaming. And we kind of had a bit of a debate on stage, and I put this out to our patrons, actually, the video of it, about mini consoles, because you know, even though we've all got the original consoles, there is something about the minis that, particularly you, you always like to have them in your collection. Isn't it really funny because of I'm I'm such a technophobe. 
like with like new stuff like people just go oh you know sell all your old gear and just get it all on you know evercade or get it all on emulation stuff like that and i'm like no i love it like i've you know i love playing on my crt and you know rgb cables and all this kind of stuff but then as soon as a mini console comes out i buy it <laughs> like i'm like yeah it's there in hd so it, it, it's funny i'm such a hypocrite but obviously there's been a lot of hype um around the mega drive mini 2 you know, which obviously was announced for Japan about three or four months ago. And then about two months ago, they announced the Genesis one was coming out in North America. But there's been no kind of like your like details on the European le- release of it. 99% sure that we would obviously get a European release of it. Um, and they have now announced it. It's going to be coming out on October 27th uh, in the UK and the rest of Europe. And as well as that, they have now announced the full uh, Mega Drive list, um, which is 61 games for the Mega Drive Mini 2, uh, which does include... Can, can I just say, can I just say, Night Trap's on there. And I did say about three months ago, how amazing would it be I, if I, Night Trap I was <laughs> literally about to say that. I was like, and it does include many Sega CD games. Um, I've not actually spent the time to kind of split it, like how many Mega Drive games it is and how many Sega CD games it is. But you will be happy, Dan. It does include Night Trap, which has really surprised me. Like, I really didn't think it would be on there. Like, I wanted it to be on there. But it is on there and would be here all day. Well, not all day, but we'd be here for the next 10 minutes if I was to name every single game that is on, which is coming to it. Um, there will be a list in the show notes, but there's some really like, Sega have done this a lot. They have done a lot of compilations over the last kind of like 15, 20 years. Um, but there's some really good games on there, which, you know, you don't see too often or have never seen before. Pl- Splatterhouse 2. I mean, that's already been Sewer announced. Sewer Shark. Sewer Shark. Night Trap, Final Fight CD, which we mentioned on the show the other week. Yeah. Um, Sonic Se- which, which actually, yeah, I, I played that in after we talked about it. Yeah. I, I burnt a disc and played it on my Mega CD. Can I be controversial and say I actually think that's better than the Super Nintendo? Oh, it version? is. It is better than the Super Nintendo. Well, it's 100%. Go. I'm not going to get hate on my No, it's not, con- <laughs> it's not controversial. It is. It's better than the uh, the Super Nintendo. It's an almost arcade perfect port of it. Yeah. And, I'd never played and it before. It, it's got the two player on there, um, Mansion of Hidden Souls. One thing that I think is pretty cool is the Echo the Dolphin games are on there, but they're the Sega CD versions. So they've got those digital music, uh, digital soundtracks on there, which I think is really cool. Uh, Outrun, Outrunners, Streets of Rage 3, um, Shining Force CD, Alien Soldier, Earthworm Jim 2. So the Desert did, Strike. Did, Desert Strike, yeah. Did, like, the other consoles have as many games as this? Like, this 60 to me, well, 61, seems like a pretty huge list of games to come out. I remember seeing um, the other titles and, like, you get launch titles and they wouldn't the, have as many on the minis. Now, but this is... a good question i'm trying to think so the playstation mini i want to say had between 20 and 30 the super nintendo mini i think had around about 22 um the mega drive there's, mini there's 42 the, on the mega drive mini yeah the me, first mega drive mini i was going to say i'm sure it was around about 40 so 42 um but i'm quite confident that there's either no repeats or very few repeats it might be no repeats from the mega drive one to the mega drive two mm. yeah yeah, there might there might be a couple on there, but yeah, this is pretty big. This is yeah. there's a, there's price, a lot of games. If, on if here. the price point's good, then uh, this is quite a quite a um, steal, really. I don't know if they've really. I think the price point is around. Oh, I could be wrong, but I want to say it's around seventy pounds, which I'm pretty sure the first one was around that. Maybe the first one was around fifty sixty. But yeah, I mean, I'll be picking it up October twenty seventh. I'm an absolute sucker for this. Probably just to play Night Trapper. There's Ninja Warriors on there and Elemental Warriors. This could um, be my. First mini console, I think. It could uh, be. With, with, with this amount of titles, I'm, I'm actually really impressed. And Sega CD is a library that I've not explored, mm. but also getting it upscaled into HDMI and stuff. That's going to mm. be interesting to see how they've yeah. done that, you know, seeing Night Trap on the uh, yeah. on the screen yeah, in yeah. 720p. Yeah. It's going to be uh, pretty hard. <laughs> they've also added some unreleased games on there or newer games they say in the trailer came out 2022 uh super locomotive um devi and pi or p verse pura pura sun and space harrier 2 i'm not too sure what the story is there um whether they're games that never came out or they're games you know that have been developed recently but they all say they're coming out 2022 it's the first time these games are being released um which are four bonus games on there which is pretty cool just a desert strike on there for me it's yeah like, yes <laughs> Well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, you mentioned that price point. If they do manage to get it out for about that 70, 80 quid mark. I mean, the fact that you're getting 61 games over the weekend when we're in Norway, I nearly picked up 
Night Trap Collector's Edition on the Nintendo Switch. You did. And that yeah. was £70 pounds just for that. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it, I mean, if you're talking like, you know, value, if, if you were to get a collection yeah. of Mega Drive and Mega CD games for like a modern console, say the hardware costs 10 quid, you know, you get the controller, of the, the system, you're talking like a pound a game. You are, you are talking a pound a game. And story time here, that was quite funny because you sat back down at our booth and you're like, oh, I almost bought Night <laughs> Trap. It came in like a big PC box version, but for the Switch. And you were like, I really want that. And your like, knee was jerking and I could tell you wanted it. And after like half an hour, you were like, I'm going to go check if it's there. And you came back and you were like, I just saw somebody walking around with it in there and there. Hello. <laughs> so like, follow them home. So follow them home. But yeah, no, uh, you don't need to buy it now. It's coming out on the on the Mega Drive Mini 2. And uh, these yeah. minis are coming out. There, there are rumours of a, of a sharp 68K one that... Um might be approaching, so that could be something that we'll be covering in the future. Let's see. Yes, yeah, so I've got to think kind of, we're getting quite obscure mm. with consoles when we get to that stage. I mean, I, I did make a joke at the weekend that I like an Atari Jaguar Mini, but, you know, maybe that'll happen. Maybe it's going to get to a stage where, you know, they've kind of done all the main consoles and the different variants of them. So maybe they're going to like kind of go into the more obscure ones. Uh, we need ones. the Lynx Mini first. <laughs> the Lynx yeah. Mini. Yeah, that would be that. cool as. <laughs> Yeah, so if you want to check that out, um, the full list of games, all 61 of them, I'll put that and the rest of the stories that we talk about this week in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, that massive panel, Paul Makachek and Kev Bayliss live at Retro Mesa, coming up on the show in just a second. Before we do that, let's just take a quick moment to give a big thank you to this week's sponsor, and that is our wonderful friends at Better Help. Now, we are big believers that... You need to take care of not only your, your physical health as well, but your mental health is just as important. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I say it every time, better help support us. And I'm a huge, huge advocate of mental health and making sure that you reach out to people and talk about it. And I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you had something like a car and you were told this is the only car you're ever, ever, ever going to have your entire life, you would absolutely take care of it. You know, any sort of dents, any sort of like little bangs on there, any sort of little scrapes and scratches, you we would clean that up straight away. You would be on it. You would be fixing that the day it happens. So why don't we do this when these little bumps and dents and scratches happen to our brains and our minds and these bumps in the roads? You know, sometimes we'll just leave it and not talk to anybody about it. And sometimes it might go away and sometimes it might get worse. But better help are there for you to talk to. And I think they're absolutely fantastic because you don't necessarily have to pick up the phone and talk to them. You can do it all online if you want to. You can do it over text. And I think it's just it's so important that you do you kind of like buff out these scrapes and, you know, bang out these dings and stuff like that by talking to somebody. And I think particularly as guys, often mm. we don't think to do that, do we? No, exactly. You know, it's, 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 it's something I've had to come to terms with over the last couple of years, you know. Oh, God, why would you talk to somebody about that? But, you know, absolutely it does. It helps massively, especially with better help. Yeah, so um, there are lots of ways I can help you have a healthy brain. And like Joe mentioned, it's online therapy. And they offer video, phone, even live chat only therapy sessions. So if you're not comfortable being on camera or chatting, you can just do it on your keyboard as well. The good thing is it's much more affordable than in-person therapy because I think that's another misconception that, you know, therapy is only really for rich people, but this is really affordable. And actually you'll be matched to a therapist in under 48 hours. So we are big believers in this and that we love working with BetterHelp. So if you'd like to try their service for yourself, um, we've actually got you a great deal where you'll get 10% off your first month. If you use our exclusive link, betterhelp.com slash retro. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash retro and a big thank you to our friends at better help for their support of our show right then next we're going to check out this incredible live panel that we did at retro mesa in norway this huge gaming event over the weekend where we sat down on stage for an hour with the legends from rare paul makachek and kev bayliss that's next on the retro hour podcast Hello everybody, we're doing a panel now with Kev Bayliss and Paul Makachek and you have a really good relationship in uh, Rare Software where you've worked together for many years on some amazing titles. We're the Retro Hour podcast and uh, this is me, Ravi Abbott and, and Joe uh, Fox. Yeah, I'm Joe Fox and uh, yeah, let's just uh, crack on and hear some amazing tales and stories about some amazing Rare games. Yeah, so how, how did you guys meet then? What was like your first meeting and where were you in your career at that point? So this chap here, 
has got an amazing memory, okay? We were in the car a couple of days ago, and he told me what I was wearing on my first day at Rare in July 1988. Paul had been working really hard on something else before he actually applied to come work at Rare, and I knew that he was, he was coming, and we, there was only about five or six of us at, at the company at the time. But I just remember him appearing one afternoon, and everybody was looking really sort of morbid, and uh, Paul had actually been working so hard that he'd driven his car from one place to another very late at night, and on the motorway managed to veer off the motorway and fall asleep and hit several trees and completely total his little tiny hatchback car that he owned at the time. So, yeah, he came in and uh, he trashed his car and almost trashed himself, and he thought that he wasn't going to actually be able to take the job because of that, but um, we said, it doesn't matter. Start as soon as you can start. And how old were you guys? I would, if that was July, June or July the following year, I would have still been 16. I'll, I'll be honest here. First time I met Kev, I remember walking up to him and I had, we hadn't been introduced and I thought he was a child. <laughs> fact, I thought he was Tim's son. People still briefly. think I'm a child. <laughs> you act like one, yes. Yeah, that's how we met anyway. And uh, it's been love ever since. Actually, we haven't seen each other for quite a long time because I, I left around 2005. And um, I took my break from the industry to do music, and uh, that didn't work too well. But then when I stepped back into the industry, I've also I started doing a little bit more stuff with social media recently, and it was on YouTube that I asked, called Paul up, and I said, do you want to talk about one of the games that we're actually going to talk a little bit about today? And um, yeah, he, uh, he joined me on a, like a stream, I guess, and then we just talked about one of the games. And yeah, so, but this is the first time in the flesh that I've seen Paul since the time I think I was invited down to Rare to talk about the Rare Replay games. When yeah, so about seven years ago when we were working on Rare Replay, Kev got an invite to come back on site and he was like a kid in a candy shop. I mean, he was so excited to come back and see the place again uh, and, and, and run into some old friends that he hadn't seen in a long time. Yeah, it was a catch-up. There's still a fair few people from the very, very old days at Rare, aren't there? Yeah, well, I've been there for 34 years. Greg Mayles, who is the father of Banjo, um, he's been there 33. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of, bunch of folks. Hugh, Mark, Pete. Uh, all sort of blend, blending years. in with the, the scenery now because you've been there that long. Yeah, I mean, Chris Marler, who's here and sings the poo song all the time. <laughs> Bless him. He's only been there 26 years, so it doesn't really count. But this yet. is what happens when you, when you work in the video games industry. So long you start singing about the ridiculous characters you made <laughs> years ago or doing ridiculous voices, it's just part of it. But it's a great industry to be in. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on. I've got a, another talk afterwards, which is a slight side thing, but I'm going to talk about how I got into it in a bit more detail. So, Awesome. So um, you guys actually worked on WrestleMania for the Nintendo together. What's the story there? And how did you kind of go about getting the contract with the WWF? And what was that like? Because I heard you actually went and met with them. Uh, well, um, yeah, I was talking to um, Rabbit about this this morning. When I first met Joel Hochberg, who was uh, Rare's associate in the US, we had a, an office over in the US, and he had a really good relationship with Nintendo, and it was kind of him that introduced Tim to the whole Nintendo environment, and, and so they, they worked a lot with Nintendo directly because of Joel. And uh, he came over to visit, and I was still only a kid, and he, they were watching these videos, and I could hear all these noises coming from the, the meeting room. And I could hear her laughing, and he just picked up that elephant. And I thought, what are they talking about in there? And they called me into the room, and I saw that they were watching uh, wrestling videos. And they said, we're going to be doing a wrestling game, Kevin, so you should probably come in and watch this. And it was quite unlike any wrestling that I'd ever seen before. Because in the UK, we had wrestling, but it used to come on on a Saturday afternoon. It was, a, it was very, very dull down old grannies in the front row and just standing up and jeering at the, the two guys that weren't really big guys at all. And then all of a sudden I was looking at this, this sort of carnival in a ring with people throwing each other all over the place that weighed, I don't know, there were seven foot five, Andre the Giant, and six foot eight, Hulk Hogan. And I know all the specs because they sent us all the specs to say that this wrestler has to look like this and this wrestler's this big. And so I don't know how we got the contract, but I'm guessing it was something to do with Joel. And uh, I was put onto that. I did WrestleMania, which was my first game, which is why it isn't very good on the <laughs> NES. But it sold a lot of copies because it had Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan on the front. And then I did WrestleMania Challenge, I think, which was a sequel. 
Um, and I met the ultimate warrior there, and it was like a huge giant. And then um, after that, I worked with Paul on a couple of Game Boy titles, and we got together to write uh, WWF Superstars, which is the game that we are going to be focusing on, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering how important was it for like having the intro music, having the special moves in there, and you know, getting the fans into that wrestling game because they could actually you know, hear the intro music and, and see the special abilities of the players. After learning from the first game that uh, it was just a... I, I didn't realise, because I didn't really understand the wrestling culture, how important it was that this guy has this special trademark move and this guy has the special theme tune. I mean, the music wasn't my department, but it was, Dave did a really good job of recreating everybody's themes. But it was ultra important. It sent us the track for whoever had like Hulk Hogan's real American theme and, and everybody had their own spe specific piece of music. And also uh, they were very, um, they wanted to me to be very precise with what was basically sort of, I don't know, 40 odd pixels high, 40 pixels wide. And I hadn't got very much to play with and I'd only got three shades of dark green, um, dark green to light green to really use in a very low resolution to sort of define these characters' mugshots. But uh, we, we had a little bit of banter before the start of every wrestling match and we, we tried to draw people in and you put the scrolling stars in the background, didn't you? So we just tried to jazz it up a little bit and because it was my third game, I just wanted bigger sprites and the great thing about the Game Boy was, Paul, if you want to just explain it, it had actually better sprite capability than the, the NES. Yeah, as Kev says, you know, when you watch American wrestling, it's loud. Visually loud, it's audially loud, that word. Um, yeah, you know, we were trying to do that on the Game Boy. You know, the screen shakes violently when when they do pile drivers on each other and um, and the sort of big effects. Whatever we can do in there, that sort of gave you just a solid bit of audio visual feedback. Um, we we put that in there. Um, actually, th that game was a rush. We were working ballistic hours. We don't do this anymore. And we don't condone it. But you know, back then we were given a very short period of time to write this game uh, for. Reasons I won't completely go into right now. Uh, basically, Tim Stamper approached us and said, look, would you have a look at this game, which was being produced elsewhere? And we went, no, if we're going to do something, let's do it again from scratch. And I asked him when the deadline was, and he said Saturday. Uh, and before I had the chance to question that, uh, he said, look, we can probably stall the publisher for about three months uh, if you can do it in that time. So, uh, and three months and one week later, we'd finished it. So we, we pretty much did it to brief, but we were working very, very long hours at, at that point. Uh, to get it done and um, you know what it went pretty well didn't it it was quite um, a, a simplest I mean because we had there was a, an arcade version with all the WWF stars uh, and they, that, that really looked great I think it was done by Tato I can't remember now but it had really great big sprites wrestling around in the ring and I wanted to make sure that this was because after all it was going on the Game Boy and if you want to see that the uh, the characters are interacting with each other they need to be quite large and quite clearly defined. So they were quite big and cartoony, and you got Mr. Perfect and Hulk and Randy Macho and Savage and all that. I'm not going to do the voices. But um, <laughs> we wanted to just keep the gameplay as simple as possible, and we just had we managed to get the scrolling in, up and down, because you could come out of the ring, which we thought was an important feature, because we were always seeing most of the action was taking place outside the ring when somebody was hitting each other with a chair or something like that. If we got a bit longer, we perhaps would have added those kind of things, like a prop to hit the other character with, and beef it up maybe have a tag and, and something like that but it was very simple and I think we could have really knocked up a sequel had we got the luxury of more time but it was done as Paul said when he types there's smoke coming off the keyboard because he's just working around the clock and it, it just really came together really fast but that because we'd also worked on a few more Game Boy titles and so we did know the score with each other, didn't we? Yeah, so, uh, you know, just going back to the sprite thing, one of the things that was handy about that game, we were able to have the characters quite large on the screen because there's only two of them. There's nothing else going on. You know, it's not like writing Donkey Kong Country and there's stuff all over the place flying around. And uh, I was very familiar... Uh, the interesting thing moving to the Game Boy, uh, you know, we were given a stupid deadline to do this, and the interesting thing moving to the Game Boy is architecturally it's very similar to the NES, and we've just done a couple of NES games together. The only difference really was, was the processor, but I'd already worked on that processor on ZX Spectrums and Amstrad CPCs that are all out there now before I joined Rare. So, so we, were, we were able to jump on that. And there's, there's lots of stuff in there which actually takes a lot of work which people don't appreciate. That tiny little bit of scrolling 
with the uh, with the ring just moving a little bit. I had to write an edge update, which is what you would do for a big long level in a battle toad game or something, you know. So there's quite a lot of extra code in there that that, that you don't appreciate is there, uh, just to just to give the slight effect that that you can see a little bit more. Um, then we then we could fit on the screen. It made the game feel a lot less claustrophobic, though, because I remember on the first one they just felt very static, and they were just two little characters on this static ring with a few twinkles in the background, and it was it worked. And as I say, it had Hulk Hogan on the title page, and which was great fun to draw and everything. But technically, compared to this game, also I think the one thing that we could really push was the size of those sprites because. Uh, the limitation of the NES was if you got so many scan lines, if you got any sprites per line problem, which meant that if there was more than 64 pixels in a line on a, it was eight sets of eight sprites. After that, they couldn't draw any more, process any more. So often on an NES, you will see it looks like a glitch when something's horizontal. Uh, bits will start disappearing and flashing, which is why the NES is perfect for vertical scrolling shooting games. But for horizontal stuff, if you've got anything large, you'll often see things disappear. Whereas on the Game Boy, you could have 10. So you could have 80 pixels in a line before they started to disappear, I think. Uh, that, that's completely true. The thing was that on some of the later games, particularly when we were doing the Battletoad games, um, there was enough stuff going on there that we had to use other tricks. So um, we used to multiplex sprites. So you would... You would print some sprites on one frame and some sprites on another frame and flip backward and forward between them. So you could actually display more stuff on the screen. You'd never get away with that on a console, but the Game Boy screen was so slow and laggy that it didn't matter. It was just a bit of a blur anyway, and, and people couldn't see any flickering, so we kind of got away with it. So you could actually sort of visually get more on the screen than the hardware is capable of doing. So um, what was Rare Coin it, and how were they connected to WWF Superstars for the Game Boy release? Um, so we had an agent, Joel Hochberg, uh, who was based in Miami. You know, he, he was signing us up to do a lot of IPs for other people for a while. And Rare Coinet was a the, joint the, the name came from, I think Joel also owned, he made his, his initial fortunes from, uh, he owned arcades. Um, so all of the, the machines that you can see uh, in any old retro arcade, he had plenty of those. And uh, when, I think when we took the Battletoads arcade machine, we um, took it to one of his... Um, arcades to give it sort of a test run and we did the same with Killer Instinct but it was really handy to have that but that's that's the name of Rare Coin It it came from the Coin Coin It opera, Coin Operated Arcades Well uh, another title was Beetlejuice as well and um, what what was the connection with like Warner Brothers and what, what was the feedback from them as well when you when you kind of started on that project had you seen Beetlejuice before we had we had a video didn't we uh, we, we saw the film loved the film in fact I remember watching the film with, with Chris Stamper and, and Mark Betteridge and, uh, and said afterwards, oh, that would make a really good video game. And then I got given it with Kev. Yeah. We had to do it. Um, we didn't really get any feedback from Warner Brothers. Uh, unfortunately, I can't say the same for the publisher, LJN. Oh, dear. There was uh, graphical <laughs> feedback. I was, I was, there was graphical feedback. Um, that I had some issues, very similar kind of issues as you got with most of the licensed products, which were from a film where you've got an actor playing the protagonist or whatever, and, and in Beetlejuice it was Michael Keaton. And the only artwork I'd got to go on was the the front cover of the VHS tape, which was Michael Keaton standing behind, is it Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin or somebody like uh, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, he's sort of doing his pose and laughing, and there's a picture of him on the back. And so the title page on Beetlejuice is, I digitised it basically by just copying the picture using the graph paper and using as many of the colours as I could in the NES to get a likeness of Michael Keaton, dressed as Beetlejuice that you would see debuting for the first time. And they said, oh, you can't use that, it looks too much like Michael Keaton. So, um, <laughs> again, I've just spent the last six months trying to make damn well sure that Hulk Hogan looked like Hulk Hogan, and now you're telling me I can't let this character look like the actor that's playing them. And so it's all I've been doing is making sure that Andre the Giant looked like Andre the Giant. It was the right weight and size. But now I was told that I had to make it look like the character. And I didn't know what the character was because the only character reference that was was the film. And then they sent over this beautiful style guide, uh, which was um, for the... There was a cartoon series that a company called DIC made. And they uh, produced other cartoons like Inspector Gadget and lots of the other big Saturday morning TV shows that you've got in the US and over here. 
And um, they asked me if I could use the style guide and sort of tailor everything. But unfortunately, I did it. And the little sprite character looked much more like... The, but I still, to this day, every time I look at the picture, it still looks like Michael Keaton to me. But they said, no, that, that's better. And I think I must have just tweaked a pixel around his eye. I think there, there was some, obviously some licensing or sort of copyright in this. It can't have too much of a likeness because maybe Michael Keaton could have sued us for whatever or claim royalties from Nintendo or whoever. I don't know, but there was, there was a lot of that with doing the licensed products. And, um, you know, that's why there was so much fun to work on. Yeah, I mean... Roger well, Rabbit. <laughs> yeah. We didn't want to do licensed products and Battletoads was our first attempt in a big way to try and get away um, from doing those games. We often got a lot of feedback that didn't really make a lot of sense. And we kind of had to do stuff. And, you know, I remember we, we, the thing was we were working with people that weren't in our time zone. Okay, so Americans are eight hours out. And so we would get long faxes of things coming through on a fax machine overnight. And I'd walk in in the morning and see the fax that came in. And there'd be a list of 20 things they want changed in the game. And it's like, well, could you change the background color of the title page from blue to red? Because more people will buy it. And things like that. So those were fun days. Yeah, I think um, they, obviously people were appointed to work with us from these companies and, and make sure that the game was going to be every bit as good as the film or the cartoon and not necessarily mean that they were a designer and everybody has got an opinion and so everyone can, can be class themselves as a designer and there's no right or wrong, but we were a game development studio and uh, so you'd often have your idea of what the game was going to be and you'd send it off to them and they say, wouldn't it be good if... And they, you'd have everything would start changing. And as soon as you start doing that, you start breaking the whole fabric of the game and it starts to become something else. And before you know it, you've got this mishmash of a game. And I think a lot of the licensed products did suffer from that. But um, the wrestling game, on the other hand, there's no story. So that was a straightforward VS match. And so that was, that was quite straightforward. So um, you mentioned licensing there, and you also mentioned the Beetlejuice cartoon. What's the story and connection with Beetlejuice and Battletoads? The company, as I mentioned, DIC, that did produce that um, Beetlejuice, I'm sure it was DIC, if I'm, I'm wrong. Yeah, correct I think it was. Me. It was yeah. DIC that created the Beetlejuice cartoon, also created the Battletoads pilot, which is such a gem, and I urge you to all go and watch it. Because uh, we, I, can, I was really excited when I came up with the Bar Battletoads characters. And they said, it's going to be a cartoon. We're going to meet with this company in Los Angeles. And I was sitting there at this breakfast table, delaying everyone because I'd ordered myself a steak. And I remember Joel Hochberg saying, what's taking so goddamn long? And, and these people said, it's, it's, the, it's the well done steak, sir. And I just sort of shrunk into my seat. Because like, we've got this meeting with this company that, in the middle of California. And we went there. Sorry we're late. Kevin wanted a steak. And uh, I was just so excited. There was this Inspector Gadget on the walls. Oh, my God, it's, it's happening. And then, uh, yeah, it happened. And uh, we got this email from, I don't know, an email, a fax at the time saying, um, yeah, it's going to be aired on Thanksgiving and then again on the Sunday or whatever it was. And it was just a ri ridiculously bad cartoon. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but, I mean, it's probably worth a lot of money now. I've got a copy if anybody wants to buy it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's, that's what happened. And so that was the link with DIC. Um. Well, um, Paul, you ended up working with Kerry Gunn on quite a few of the graphics because um, you would initially do it, Kev, and then you'd yeah, kind of move on to move something on to else. Project, yeah, yeah what, what was it like working with Kerry and um, what kind of stuff did you do? Well, you took the sprites. It was mainly what I would move on from it because I think I know a lot of the time I'd move on to something else and then you'd pick up with the design with Kerry on that. I can remember that she did a lot of the... Um, the sprite animations once I got it started because when I tried to play Beetlejuice a little while ago I couldn't remember how to play it because I remember you continued doing that with Kerry but she was um, Kerry Gunn was uh, uh, Brendan Gunn's sister who worked on Captain Skyhawk so well, she did a ton of games um, she was on Donkey Kong Land actually yeah so I mean a lot of the Game Boy games you worked on with her so we, there was a there were people at the company that were sort of um, earmarked to work on particular products because they were familiar with whatever system. And I think Paul was the go-to Game Boy guy. Go-to Game Boy guy? That's cool. It's got a bit of a ring to <laughs> it. did write a lot of games on the Game so, Boy. Is yeah, that at the top think, of your CV? <laughs> <laughs> because we'd obviously worked with each other plenty. And I think uh, Kerry had also been appointed to 
to work on the games as well and then it was just another member of the team yeah i mean the, 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 there was a pool of people there and a lot of people chipped into a lot, a lot of different things at the time and uh we had fewer artists than we had programmers so not sure if i said this yesterday so when i joined rare i was employee number 17 and i was the eighth person in the studio who was writing code that meant we had eight games in production okay but we only had about four artists, so the artists were generally split Three and a half. A, I was quite small. Three and a half. <laughs> okay, yeah. We were a child. So, uh, yeah, generally speaking, the artists were split across a couple of titles. Uh, and they were helping each other out. It's, it's, it's not like we actually had teams back then. You know, it's, it's not like Kev did everything on one game and somebody else did everything on something else. Uh, so we sort of mixed and matched a bit, particularly if there was a lot of stuff that needed to happen fairly quickly. Uh, and Dave Wise just did the music for everything. He did everything for years. Although we, we did the sound effects, actually. The, the computer programmers um, had to fiddle around with the tune routine and try and make it beep and hiss uh, on the NES and the Game Boy uh, back then. Dave didn't really do sound effects, but it was, it was very much a collaborative effort. And the, the only places where you had somebody that was specializing on a single game was the, the computer programmer. So I would write a game, nobody else would be writing the software on that. Someone else would write their game, no one else was writing the software on that. Uh, and the artists and, and Dave were then supplying content to go in and, and sharing between, you know, sharing their time between multiple projects. We didn't have animators either. It was just the artists would do the title page, the front end, the sprites, every, pretty much everything. Well, the, that was what an artist's role was back then, or the, graphic engineer as we called them. The reason we didn't have animators is you should see what he was doing, okay, and all the others. The way that art was put together in those days was we had these big sort of backlit light boards, architect light boards or something, and there would be graph paper on there, and they'd stick a bit of tracing paper on top of that, and they would just have big fat marker pens, and they were drawing pixel by pixel into the little squares on the graph paper, okay? And then we had to box them up into sprite shapes, 8x8 pixels on Game Boy, 8x16 pixels with a pencil. And then we'd have to decode that. So s people would be sitting there just turning that into hex numbers. And then I'd get a disk because we didn't have a network. Somebody would come in with a floppy disk and go, here you go. And then, of course, you'd put it in and some of the pixels would be wrong and some character would be cross-eyed. Uh, and we'd have to give it back and go, go and sort your hex numbers out. Go on. So uh, it was a very painful job. The amazing thing is we almost... That's what we were doing when the first SGI machine landed at the studio. And it was a big sort of meter cube thing that sat on the floor um, with a demo of a shiny VW Beetle spinning around on it. And we're all looking at, looking at it and looking across at the light boards with marker pens and going, what the hell are we going to do with that when this is how we do artwork? Didn't go too badly, though, when Donkey Kong Country came out. But the thing was that over a period of about three years from when that machine rocked up until DKC launching, Kev, Tim, and increasingly other people were doing more and more rendering work. They were trying to work out how you could render stuff and then, and then convert it so we could put it on a NES or a Game Boy or eventually a, a Super NES. And they did a fantastic job with it. But what it meant was that stuff was feeding into our game. So increasingly, as we were writing some of the pre-DKC games, mostly the Battletoad games, there were increasing levels of rendered stuff that was going into them. Uh, and certainly the, the last Battletoad game that we wrote um, had a ton of rendered artwork in it. It just wasn't completely rendered. Some of it was still hand-drawn with marker pens. There was a phase, a transition period, when we went from this um, analogue, if you like, way of creating digital artwork, which was using the pens and the paper. Um, if you remember back in the 90s, everybody suddenly got a camcorder, and it was really cool, and everybody was like, now you've got on your mobile phones. We had a, a little handheld camcorder. And we would got the piece of hardware that Chris Stamper had developed called the Razboard, which is the hardware that the Battletoads arcade was released, that the video game was released on. And we actually made quite good use of that because each artist was eventually appointed a little, uh, it was like a really cool little case with a disk drive in it. And then on top, there was this sort of, it looked like a, a little Famicom, really. And it had a, a, a graphics chip and some processor on it. And Paul... I think it was you that wrote the the software, which was kind of a pixel editor that we used. Because when we moved from that 8-bit era, where it was very easy to pick a palette of three colors and make Hulk Hogan, and maybe if you're being 
outrageously ambitious, you might add another sprite over the top to give him a white of his eye and you start mixing sprites, but I won't go into all of that. Um, we're suddenly faced with a 16-bit console. You've got 16 colors. Now, it took forever and a day to work out all of the hexadecimal for every little box that was on your character when there was three colors. So how on earth were we going to produce games when every sprite was going to be bigger and also boast 16 colors? You'd have to work out so much data. And it was just not going to be viable, really. So we, we says, yeah, Tim and Chris had decided to embrace the digital age and move on to this um, editor-based system. And so you were in control of uh, creating some of the software. Well, I mean, the, the, the funny thing is, you know, you might ask the question, why didn't we use Photoshop? Um, Photoshop had only just come out about two years earlier uh, from when we were doing this. It was, only, it was only on Macs. And we didn't really use anything from outside the studio. So I basically went and wrote a form of Photoshop. It was like, um, I think there was another software package that most people were using at the time, which was, it was quite heavily leaning towards. Was um, He took the best bits of Deluxe, something called Deluxe Paint, and it was a piece of software that everybody would remember. There was always a picture of, uh, I think it was Tutankhamun or something like that. It was all gold and blue, and it looked really great. Go, this is the art package to use. So everybody used that, and... I think you did a stripped-down version of that for the artist, but you could also skip through these. what we would do. We would have the camcorder pointing down at the picture that I would draw on paper, which I was then going to stick underneath a piece of grid paper. But instead of putting it under the grid paper, I just put it under this camcorder, press the button, and it took a picture of it. And then I would do that eight times with all of my frames of animation. And then I could skip page by page and see my pencil drawing doing this. And so then it was just my job to start cleaning it up with the editor that Paul wrote. So. Yeah, we did it the hard way. We, we wrote our own tools and, and, and you know, made something that was bespoke but worked for us. So um, you mentioned, obviously, kind of making your own, your own programs there to get it working and stuff. Was that through the Super Game Boy then? Because you had something similar to D-Paint on the Super Game Boy as well, didn't you? I think, no, I think, um, on, I know that on the, I never actually, because when I got to the end of my time on the Game Boy, I think the the Super Game Boy was released and it enabled you to embed in the code some way of adding different colour palettes if you wanted to display it on the yeah, big screen. Yeah, okay, so uh, some games, some of the later Game Boy games were upgraded to work with that. Donkey Kong Land certainly uh, was. So, um, you know, the Game Boy was a lower resolution screen than you would get on console. So, the, you know, you just, put this, you just put the Game Boy image up on a TV screen through the Super Game Boy and, uh, and there was some spare real estate around it. So, you know, I think we put trees or bananas or something in uh, around it. And you could, you could upgrade it uh, with color palette. So it, it, uh, Donkey Kong Land looks really nice with the colors. But also there were things in the game where I was taking advantage of the laggy Game Boy screen to get things to work. And unfortunately, there was a bit too much clarity then viewing it through a console on the television. Uh, on, a, on a nice sharp CRT screen. So, yeah, you know, in some ways it looked better and in some ways, you know, uh, I preferred it on Game Boy, actually. There's definitely something nice about seeing that monochromatic little screen. And it, obviously it's iconic now. Everybody sees those three green colours and with the Game Boy. And it's quite comforting. But when you saw, I think, I'm sure that you could define those colours yourself and some games you could buy them and when you put them on the Super Game Boy, they would look as if somebody had really designed a great palette. But I'm sure that you, there was a default colour choice that the cartridge would all automatically put it into this colour mode and it would select because there wasn't a palette to choose from. So when I had the NES graphics, I could choose 1, 5, 2, 5 and 3, 5, which would perhaps be the orange. And then you had a set 1, 6, 2, 6, 3, 6, which were different intensities of reds, blues, greens and stuff like that. But on the Game Boy, you had no choice. You just had those three colours. So there must have been something that that hardware was doing to differentiate between sprites and say, let's put that into a different colour set on the NES. And I, I guess it did it really well when it worked automatically yeah, sometimes. Yeah, the, 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 there were some default settings. Uh, I think the biggest problem we had with Super Game Boy was uh, one of the other Donkey Kong lands, uh, two or three, which I didn't write, but they did use my engine. There was a slight problem. It turned out that nobody in our testing department, because, you know, looking at a small screen all the time, all day long, is actually quite hard work. Um, and you're also hunched over it 
Uh, so I, I used to go crick in the back of my neck looking at this thing. So our testing department, when the Super Game Boy came out, um, they didn't want to play it on the Game Boy. Okay, so they played it on a Super Game Boy and just looked at a normal television. Unfortunately, so did Nintendo's test department. In fact, it turned out by the time we released the game, nobody had actually played it on a Game Boy itself. And uh, unfortunately, uh, as a result of that, a bit of code was left in um, so that when you completed the game and it's supposed to go, congratulations, that was awesome, it crashed 100% of the time. And we had to pull, I think it was half a million copies of the game from the shops because <laughs> it was on cartridge and you can't update because we didn't have online and stuff those days. So um, a, a lot of cartridges had to be pulled back and, um, and the engineer responsible had to do another build of the game. It wasn't me, I'm innocent. Amazing bit of kit, though. I think it, it makes you wonder whether it was actually perhaps first intended as a development tool mm. for creating and testing the, uh, in Nintendo, and maybe they decided we can make some money out of this, so let's put it out there as a peripheral. And it, it, it could have been. The, the, the Game Boy, actually, I was about to say, it, it, in some ways it was physically the hardest thing to work on because you are actually hunched over this thing on your desk. We used to prop it up and at an angle. Light too, because if it's dark, you can't see yeah. what's going on. There. Yeah, uh, and, and the, we, we also had these home-built development cartridges. We had them on, on NES. We, we built our own for Game Boy and a few other things. And they were just great big circuit boards, sort of this long, hanging out the top of the Game Boy. So you couldn't even move it around. You couldn't pick it up because you just ripped the cartridge out of it. So you're, you're in this sort of position. So, you know, you spent several years hunched over these things at three o'clock in the morning with a really stiff neck. I was about to say it was like the, physically the hardest thing to work on. But actually, I lied because the Virtual Boy came along. We did oh, spend God. three months <laughs> mucking about with that. Uh, and we did start writing a Donkey Kong game. I actually had a, a jungle level running, rats running around, DK collecting bananas on Virtual Boy. And then we just decided that my neck couldn't take it. So we stopped and went and wrote Banjo-Kazooie instead, which seemed like a better idea at the time. The well, alternative uh, to, to using that Game Boy, um, Super Game Boy, would have been to pimp up your Game Boy, of course, with the Light Boy and the speaker system and it, the magnifications. And everybody's desk, I don't think you'd have been able to put that much equipment on your desk just to see this tiny two-inch screen. Yeah. Well, with Donkey Kong Land, you came from Silicon Graphics and you were using the same assets on the Game Boy. So what was the process of taking those huge renders and getting them down to that size without, like, degrading the image that much or automating um, it? I, I have to say, the tech behind it... So, we, we wrote a Game Boy game, the first Battletoad game, and I wrote an engine to get it to work. And while we, I was finishing that game, I, I was thought... I came up with some ideas how I could improve it, improve the performance of the engine. So we then wrote a second Battletoad game. I did the upgrades. It was a better engine. I could shift some more graphics around. And then the same thing happened for the third and the fourth ones that we wrote. And when, when we got to Donkey Kong Land, I'm just looking at what we need to move about on the screen. It was just way, way more artwork, more sprites, bigger sprites as well. Um, and also, instead of having like a three-frame toad walk, as we did on the first game, we had Kev thoughtfully decided to render 16 frames of, of, of Donkey Kong running around, right? So you're actually having to push a lot more stuff to the screen. Uh, a lot more quickly and I realized that the Battletoad engine just wasn't going to cut it so I took it and I heavily rewrote it and uh, I remember saying having a chat with Chris Sutherland because we all wrote our own software right everybody wrote their own engines and I said you know the last game on Game Boy whatever it was Spider-Man or something that, that you were writing how much data could it push to the screen every game frame and he said about six or eight characters uh, and I told him I, I, I was doing 26 on Donkey Kong Land and, and without being able to do that we wouldn't have been able to get that on that machine. We obviously it was based on DKC in fact the, the original quest, uh, ask was could I just port DKC onto Game Boy and I said no um, I'd have to write everything from scratch, it was a ton of work if we did some design work we could just have a new game and people would go and buy that if they like the first one. So Tim agreed to that and what we did was the, the first level it's a bit like the first Battletoad game, actually. The first level is very, very similar jungle level to the first level of DKC. We just laid it out again as, as a new level, but it uses the same artwork. Um, and with that familiarity, we, we were working out how to fit that into the resolution of the, of the, of the screen um, and just get a basic ratio game ratio as running. well, wasn't it? So it wasn't four to three. So. Yeah. So, you know, it, what we did was we scaled down all the graphics a little bit. I can't remember. It was like 10% or something. Um, we didn't want DK to be 
dominant on the screen, just filling the screen, obviously, because you need to be able to see what's going on in front of him as it's scrolling, you know. Um, and you need other things on the screen as well. So I, th I, th I think we shrunk, shrunk all the artwork about 10, maybe 15% actually, just zoomed it down a bit. Um, and it was easy to convert um, because it, it had all already been prepared for, for Super NES, which is a character-based console. Um, it, was, it was relatively easy just to sort of depalletize it um, and get it into the, into the Game Boy. Um, the problems that we had were the sheer amount of stuff that we had to get on screen. There's a lot of big characters in, at, at times. It's very, very busy. So one, you had to push it out to video RAM during the, the small periods of time um, that you've got access to that. So that was the engine thing that I, I had to upgrade. But the other thing was you had to design the game in a way that took into account the constraint of the screen. It was a different aspect ratio um, to the console. Um, but you, know, you needed enough time to see what was coming on the screen so you could respond to it. Okay, we weren't trying to do a speed of bite level on Battletoads where I have seen people play that thing blindfold on YouTube. They just know where everything is. You know, this, uh, you know, the DK games were far more dynamic. Generally, a lot of things were placed in places that were predictable, but they were moving, moving around. And you had to give the player a chance to see something appearing on the screen, c coming on the edge as you're moving around so that they can respond to it. So, you know, doing a straight port of DKC make the most sense at that point in time. Although we did eventually do it on one of the, other, one, one of the later Game Boys, on the Game Boy Color, I think. So, um, obviously, Donkey Kong Country was kind of pushing the Super Nintendo to its limits and was seen as kind of next-generation graphics. And then Donkey Kong Land came out, which, you know, by the sounds of things, pretty much did the exact same thing, pushed the Game Boy to its absolute limits. What was people's kind of initial reactions when they first saw Donkey Kong Land on the Game Boy? They were probably quite shocked, I, I, I would hope so. <laughs> we, spent a, we spent a year on it, and, uh, and it, was, it, it was a really great team. We actually had about 15 people on it, and we did work incredibly hard um, to get that on there. And I, think, I didn't think it was going to look the way that it ended up looking. Um, I know what I hope to get out of it, and I was, I was pleasantly surprised when, when we got that out there. I mean, it was hugely positively reviewed. It sold 4 million copies. I don't think anybody particularly hated it. I think as an artist at the company, I was shocked when I saw and with that and Killer Instinct. They all went through the same sort of process. And when, I think when we first started looking at the Silicon Graphics machines, I can remember being in a pub one night on a Friday evening. One of the very rare occasions that I, I left rare at five o'clock. And we went out and this guy came up to me and he got he heard through the grapevine that... Um, Rare were buying all of these silicon graphics machines. He said, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you wasting your time on all that for? You? And he was thinking about the Super Nintendo. He says, you, you're not going to be able to display 16 million colors in 15 colors. You're wasting your time. And um, I said, no, it, it does work. Because what we did, basically did, we, we ran this software that the guys had written, which got sort of more and more good at its job, if you like. And what it did, it would play all of the frames that I would render of Donkey Kong moving along or any of the KI characters. And it would kind of average and, and pick as many of the colours as it could and say, well, this is basically the colour palette that it uses. So, yeah, it might have a red T-shirt on Diddy and a red hat and everything. But when you've got that on a 3D model, you've got loads of shades of brown. And then you've got maybe the light might be slightly green and so you're adding a different colour here and then... You've got reds and you've got pinks and you've got all these different colours and then the shadow might cast a different blue and so all of a sudden you've got, yeah, hundreds of colours. But fortunately, the CRT screen blurs all those colours together and the software just said, right, here's your 16 million colours or whatever it is. Basically, I think let's try and, I think it's called posturization. It just turns it down to, it picks up an average and if it's below this level, it will make it a red and it makes it a brown here and it does all of that until eventually it's got a 15 colour palette and you, and you sort of go, this is going to look bad. And, and, and it, the first few runs that we did, they didn't look bad. They just might have looked, uh, the software didn't have enough passes to try and generate the colour palette. And so you might have had a very glitchy looking shadow and it hadn't chosen the colours that wisely. And I think you could almost change your lighting to try and be a bit more forgiving. And, and I think the code could sort of um, be biased towards certain colours. And when you actually saw it there, as long as it was moving and you got the highlight 
and the shadow, it looked 3D and you got that slight blur of a CRT screen. It just looked like what I'd got on the SG machine. I saw when I saw it, I go, it's terrible, it's terrible. I don't like this, it's just the 16 colours, we can't do this. But then when people saw it for the first time and then we improved the software, they look at it. I can't tell the difference. It looks fine. I'm certainly sure that nobody at home has ever seen the SGI version of it is ever going to complain because look what they're getting. But then I thought, yeah, but three colours, that's really pushing it. And I was just absolutely amazed when I could see Jago and I could even see the slits in his jeans just sitting and jumping up and down on the tiniest screen in the world. And I think that's what helped it, the fact that it was shrunk down so much. Your eyes can't detect every pixel and so it... It does the same as a CRT screen. It doesn't blur. My eyes do now anyway. That's why you all look so beautiful. Because I can't <laughs> see anymore. But it's, um, it's just uh, one of those things that you, you find these, these quirks of the system. And fortunately for us, the CRT screen helps. Because if you look at DK or anything like that on a new modern monitor now, it looks quite pixelated in places. But back then, it looked great. And on a Game Boy, because it was on such a tiny screen, it looked solid and it, it did the job. So um, on the one hand... The quality of the artwork that you see, you know, you can look at an individual frame that is rendered and go, you know what, that's better than it would have been if somebody had hand drawn it on a bit of paper. Okay. But actually, for me, one of the things that really, really changed the f fidelity of what you were seeing was the smoothness of the animations because we weren't doing three frame walks anymore. You know, Kev animates Donkey Kong to, to run and then he tells the SGI how many frames he wants, and it renders them all out. And we went from three frame, hand-drawn, to 16 frames. And it, that smoothness, you know, the resolution wasn't necessarily there, particularly on the Game Boy. But when you've got so many frames, and, and little, little bits of detail space. would just come in and out as it's animating, and it would happen very, very smoothly. And that is the thing that you're really seeing. And I, I think you see that more on the Game Boy, because it's got no colors, really. It's, it's, it's got hardly anything there. Um, and mixed in with the blurriness of the screen, things just look really, really, um, really, really solid, and solid. fluid, and smooth. But the the one thing, the danger will happen. You analyze your frames afterwards, and occasionally your model might have an error. Like maybe on the animation, my hand may have intersected with Diddy's T-shirt or something like that. And so I haven't got time to render all these frames again. So we could use a, another pixel editor, and you could always clean up that bit and put a couple of red dots on that. But you had to be so careful about it because you weren't a computer. and You just drew, I like that. And then you started cleaning up his eye. And, and then all of a sudden you'd watch the sequence play back. It looked great. And then all of a sudden you go, because you'd, <laughs> you'd improved that frame and you weren't a computer. And so often you'd end up, unless it was making sure something didn't intersect and you just saw it for a, a, a brief moment in time. It's surprising when your mind fills, fills in all of the gaps when the computer's generating it, it looked beautiful. But when you try to draw it by hand, you couldn't replicate what the computer was doing. And so it was just better just leave it alone. And so all of those little glitches, there's probably some in there where things intersect. It was just too dangerous to start muddying up the graphic. Because then it, it suddenly started to look hand-drawn again because you were drawing over it and removing all of the, the, the 3D characteristics. Well, we've hit the kind of time at the moment and it's been fascinating hearing yeah. about the journey, you know, from creating amazing developments on the uh, Game Boy and pushing it to its limits. So thank you so much for Kevin Paul. Thank you. Thank you for watching this. Show.